Hey everybody, welcome back to E3 TV. You know, in aviation, there's only so much room to be creative. As pilots, just face it, we have regulations, we have checklists, procedures. There's not a whole lot of room to be creative. But today, we're about to introduce you to an aircraft and its owner who have managed to close the gap between art, creativity, and on a really cool platform. Let's go ahead and get started. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm so glad you could be here and you'd have to have been living under a rock not to have seen this incredible aircraft. Well, we are really lucky today to not only have the owner, Liam, with us, he's gonna give us a deep dive walk around, but uh, we're gonna go through some really interesting things that people don't know about, which I'm, I'm excited about. So thanks for being here. Happy thanks to be here. for bringing this down to us. You know, I'm so excited to go through it. I've seen this plane probably 10 times. I've seen all kinds of stuff on the internet. I think you did an outstanding job about it. So before we get into the airplane, I want to talk a little bit about you because you really haven't been flying that long, right? Is it, by the way, is this your first plane? This is the first airplane I've owned, yeah. And you went from what it was to this. That's incredible. So how long have you been flying? Um, I've been flying about seven and a half years. So uh, I'm a baby pilot in the world of aviation. Uh, definitely got a late start though. And what made you decide to get flying? I always wanted to fly. I was always fascinated by aircraft, helicopters, spacecraft, airplanes, military airplanes, small airplanes, cubs, the beauty of flying, the beauty of flying in Alaska, the beauty of flying over beaches. I was always fascinated by it. I was motivated to learn about it. Uh, and, and even more so than that, I was afraid of it. Tell me about that. I, I was the kid that grew up afraid of elevators. <laughs> okay. I, I wanted to talk to every stranger. I was afraid of strangers. I, I just was fearful and uh, aviation was the thing I was most drawn to that I had the greatest fear of. So really, I just kind of put it off and put it off and put it off. But I knew I could only improve my fear of flying through confrontation, yeah. through frequent confrontation, through yeah. consistent confrontation yeah. and just go, go, go. So I waited till my mid thirties before I took my first flight lesson and it was in a T6 Texan. Oh, nice. Up in and, uh, mid Florida, right? It was out of Kissimmee. It was Warbird Kissimmee. Adventures. They've yeah. since relocated to the Carolinas, but okay. they, they did a great job making me comfortable and showing me a great time while providing an education. Uh, and I felt pretty good coming out of that. But then I went and had my first 172 lesson and I was terrified <laughs> from scratch all over again. But then you went from that to this. And, okay. and I got to tell you, I really appreciate you saying that because, I mean, I was the same way from diving, you know, scuba diving to skydiving even flying when I was younger and stuff, I was the same way. And I felt the only way I could get over it and really move ahead in life was that I just had to attack it and I had to just go engage in it and, and get through it. And so I appreciate you saying that, that's, that's great. Now, I got to know when you then went to buy this aircraft, what were the criteria? Well, what was important for you to when you were looking and searching for an aircraft? What is it you wanted? Like many people, there were a range of aircraft I was considering and I was shopping in the 20 month to 36 month ago period, which is like height of COVID on down. So everything was COVID pricing and a plane would get listed. It would be gone by the time you could call them. Mm -hmm. um, it would be under contract. Someone would buy it sight unseen. It was spooky. But I was looking for a four to six seater, single engine. I wanted to have 165 knots, but it wasn't a requirement. I wanted to be below 17 gallons per hour in fuel consumption. And I wanted it to be something parts are available for, your local mechanic can work on it. But I was looking at 182s, Arrows, Saratogas, but I was pretty dialed in on Comanche and Mooney. Okay. And then this is the M20F, and we'll get into the whole F and all that kind of stuff. So you said you didn't need the 160, 165, but we're 150 at yeah. how many gallons? 150 knots true at about 10 gallons per hour. I mean, that's Mooney. I mean, you can't go wrong pattern. with that. And then uh, we're going to go through the engine and all that kind of stuff and talk about it. But this is the four cylinder, right? Yeah. So 200 it's horse, four, 200 horsepower, four cylinder Lycoming IO 360 Alpha One Bravo. OK, so when you were looking for a plane, you were almost looking for a project plane then, right? I mean, you wanted something you could do the panel on and interior. Is that a criteria? I was willing to take on a project plane. I wanted it to be airworthy at purchase time and I was willing to take on an 
ugly old beater and, and put the work in and make it mine. I've owned some older cars over the years and I've been through the long, painful process of restoration. And so I felt that I had an okay temperament and understanding of what, what that process might be. Okay. So the big projects you did were obviously the paint. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> then you did a panel. Right? Oh yeah. Uh, interior. Yep. Like, who, who did your interior for you? So the interiors, uh, two projects. The lower panels are called the Mooney Spatial Interior, designed by Bruce Yeager, who okay. actually is retired, but he came up and installed them for me, mm -hmm. which was great. Mooney panels come into the cabin a little bit. You lose an inch or two. Uh, Bruce was able to design an STC panels that go in between the rails of the airframe. So you actually gain an inch or two. Okay. They're nice, they're new, they're pretty. And then uh, the headliner and seats were uh, custom made by Sky Comforts out of Pinellas Park, Florida. And then panel. Yeah, panel, that's a fun one. So it's an all Garmin panel installed by St. Peter Avionics Shop in St. Petersburg, Florida, my home field of Albert Whitting. Okay. It's a uh, Garmin G3X as my PFT, touchscreen PFT. The main brain and GPS for the aircraft is the 355. Not everybody knows about the 355 from Garmin. They know about the 750 and the 650. One more step down from there is the 355. It's about $5,000 cheaper. And with everything I was doing with this plane, I needed to save that $5,000. Nice unit. I had that in one of our Carbon Cubs. And I'll tell you, it says, well, I had that with the, three, the 3X. I mean, I thought that That's, was an awesome combination. combination. Yeah. And there, there, of course, there's another Garmin radio and Garmin radio panel. But uh, another crown jewel, though, is that GFC 500 digital autopilot. Yeah. It's a uh, 20 seconds button. after takeoff, hit the things <laughs> and, and go. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. Non-aviators that ride up front with me, part of their briefing is being told about the level button. See this blue outline here? If something's wonky or if I'm not very responsive, the first thing you're going to do is hit that blue level button and that plane's going to yeah. just go straight and level. That's kind of going to be step yeah. one for them okay. in an emergency. I got to tell you, shout out to Garmin because I know that's there for that scenario, but I got to tell you, when I take off out of the carbon cub, I get to 500 feet, I hit that button. And then I'm doing my other stuff and getting my headings reset. And I got to tell you, I use that level button more than most of the buttons on my Garmin autopilot. I mean, it's, uh, I love it. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not, but you know what? It works for It you. works and I can focus on other stuff. So, all right, cool. And then uh, you did panel, we did in the paint. We got to talk about the paint because the artist is awesome. And he's also from your area. Yeah. So talk about Matt, because I want to hear about, and we're going to talk about the process, but if you could just tell us a little bit about Matt first. Well, thanks for asking. I'm sure he'll appreciate mm -hmm. that. For almost 10 years, I've been friends with an artist named Matt Kress, who lives right in downtown St. Petersburg. We were hanging out the week I bought this plane. He took a look at it and he said, uh, looks like you need a paint job. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I know. He's like, are you going to do it? Do it this year? I'm like, we'll see. There's long waits. I'm trying to figure out how much everything will cost. He said, well, can I paint it? I said, uh, it's like, do you need to call the FAA, get approval? I'm like, I don't know, but let's start with the paint shop. I called a paint shop, we won't name them. And they made the very reasonable decision of saying, no, we're not letting a third party come in here. We're not letting an artist paint between our layers. Warranty, liability problems. Yep. I said, wow, I respect your business yep. decision. And I called the next shop, the next shop. And then eventually, uh, Ace Aircraft are finishing in Bartow, Florida. Yep. They said, well, can you show us some of his work? All right, that's positive. They looked at his Instagram, they said, okay, this is awesome. We won best contemporary paint job last year at Sun and Fun and the year before, we want to do it again. So uh, we would love to speak with the artists. Uh, as things progress, they purchased some, uh, a couple sample cans of the, the paint he was going to use. He's using rattle cans, handheld shaker cans of spray paint. But, but it wasn't spray paint from Home Depot. I just want to make sure everybody's clear. Right. That's... It's, it's like a premium graffiti paint line right. from a company called Montana Colors. It's the 94 series. And so Ace Aircraft for Finishing had a, a leftover piece of a tail. They, they prepared it, brought it to base white. They sprayed a couple of his things. They made them overlap. They did separate areas. They cleared it and they let it sit four months because there's a seven month wait to get in. And they said, this has to hold together at least four months before uh, we could actually agree to this, but we'll put you on the list and okay. held together. And so we had the green light to go forward. Awesome. So we're going to link to all the people we're talking about because people that are willing to progress and, and really try new things, we definitely want to make sure that we shout out to all of them. So 
We'll link to you guys as members, and if this makes it to YouTube, we'll put the links down there on YouTube too, which I'm sure it will be on YouTube. So before we start talking mechanics and get on, and we're right here, let's talk about how Matt did this job. It, it was definitely an interesting process. So Ace Aircraft for Finishing did the usual steps of stripping the plane, repairing the metal, etching, aviation primer, base coat white. And let's call that a couple of months, and then it was Matt's time. Um, Matt is a well-known mural artist. He paints paintings as well by hand, but he does a lot of prominent murals, large-scale murals, very colorful, lots of geometric shapes and portraits and so on. But Matt had never done anything this three-dimensional. He hadn't spray-painted a vehicle ever, and he hadn't worked through curves or, or right. had to spray upside down. So he ran into just technical challenges of working with the format of his medium um, or his subject. Before Matt's process began, he started talking to me about a mock-up and ideas. And I said, well, I like the geometric shapes. He's like, cool, I'll, I'll do a design, I'll do a mock-up, I'll put all the time in, I'll show you something. I said, you know what? Don't. And he's like, well, yeah, we'll, we'll make a plan. I said, no, no, no plan. Gonna let Just, an artist be an artist, right? Well, that's it. Yeah. You know, whether it's tattoos or, or painting your plane, you should find an artist you like and you love their work you share your interest or vision or preferences, and then you just have to let them run with it. An artist as prolific as Matt isn't there to be micromanaged. I'm a warlord. I would be, I, yeah. if I was digging in too much, I'd be making a lower quality experience for myself and for him. Mm -hmm. So I just let go of the controls completely. I said, do whatever you want. <laughs> Geometric shapes preferred. But uh, he's like, okay, I'll send you progress updates every few days. I said, no. <laughs> I told him and the paint shop, I want a total blackout on this. I want to have no clue. I don't want to see it on a post. I don't want to see anything. Share it with people that won't share it with me, but I'm not allowed to see it until I pick it up. All right, so before we go on, I just want to tell everybody, we're going to show you this. This plane is totally asymmetric. There is not one balanced paint scheme anywhere on this plane. And we're going to show you some camera crane shots going over the top of this, where you can see it's totally different colors on, on both sides. So it's really cool. Check that out. But tell me what his process was. Like, how did he do this? Because you told me about he had the base white on it, and then what was his process after that? So the paint Matt uses dries very quickly. It's in like one to two minutes. He was able to do potentially months of work in under one month because he could tape off just one or two sides, sometimes three, of one of his shapes, spray and let it overspray, walk to another area, put one or two pieces of tape down, spray, and again, let it overspray the boundary. Come back here, pull his tape, just mark one boundary, spray and let it overspray. Again, someplace he had to lay down all the boundaries, but because he was able to overspray and work two areas at a time, alternating between them with them drying in just a minute or two, he was able to move very quickly. He ran into challenges when it was time to shoot the underside of the aircraft. He calls me up, he says, do I, have to sh do I have to paint the bottom of the plane? I said, well, Matt, do you want to know when this plane is flying over you? He said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, how else will other people know like this plane has been painted if they're not at the airport, not on Instagram, like you got to paint the bottom then. He's like, oh, I got to paint the bottom. When he first started, he realized his cans don't function uh -oh. <laughs> upside down. He's laying on a cart underneath the plane you know, uh, having trouble with the technology. But then he figured out he could just spray it on, on, on an angle, an angle. And, and get enough of it up there <laughs> and make it happen. Interesting. Cool, so you say it took him like about a month? Huh? Yeah, uh, three weeks and change for the color portion. Okay. Which everybody thought was gonna take three times that. But right. he, he, his technique of, you know, overspray next area uh, really worked cool. out. Now, did he do the clear coat or then the paint shop did the clear the coat? The paint shop then did the clear coat. Okay. So the paint shop is standing behind the paint. Right. Then they would actually, they welcomed Matt back to work on more aircraft together with them. All right, so let's talk about firewall forward. We'll start with the engine and then I want to talk about some of the mods and stuff you did. So four cylinder, 200 horse, like homing, yep. obviously. Um, what can you tell me? And I know you did some other stuff. I mean, got to have gammy injectors, right? I love my Gammy injectors. Get this, before Gammy injectors, I had a 1.5 gallon per hour spread between my richest and leanest cylinders. If you looked at in my uh, Garmin EIS at the EGTs or even CHTs, it was a mountain range of temperatures. 
after installing Gamma injectors, I'm down to a 0.1 gallon per hour spread between richest and leanest, which ends up translating to, I can now fly lean a peak when I want that extra duration or extra savings. And I can, in general, without going lean a peak, fly a whole gallon an hour per less. Yeah. I'd still be at 150 I, knots. I want to talk about Gamma injectors for a second and shout out to them because if you don't have them, you should definitely look at them it uh, makes a big difference. What Liam just said is important, like, and especially for us, like in our Bonanza, we have a TC, turbocharged. So we'll get that thing up to 16, 17,000 feet on oxygen or 14,000 feet a lot of times, and we fly by ITIT. So we just get our TIT up to like 890, and we don't look at each cylinder as much. Having GAMI injectors in that scenario is even 10 times more important and better, because all we have to do is run that one number up to like 890, and we don't have to worry about overheating one cylinder or something because the GAMI injectors got them all nice and even and stuff. So that's important. We fly with them in the extra. We have them in the carbon cub. Um, so it just, uh, and the other reason I like them in the carbon cub, because we have the 3GX just like you do the Garmin. Oh, yeah. So you can G3X. have it do the lean assist. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's great having that and having GAMI injectors with the lean assist. It just, it makes our world so much easier. So shout out to GAMI. And if you don't have GAMI injectors, make sure you guys check them out and we'll, we'll make sure we link to them below. So. What else to this engine? Well, I want to say, again, with that lean assist and the GAMI injectors, we actually did lean assist on the way down. I was going for performance, um, plus I had good fuel prices earlier this week. So I, I flew 50 degrees rich of peak. All my cylinders were within, or all my EGTs were within about 10 degrees, which was wild. And uh, we had 151 knots. So you were rich of peak? We were rich of peak today. Okay. 150 knots. 150 knots. Now, as I'm sure you know, when you're Lena Peak, you're getting a little less power. So I lose maybe six knots going 50 degrees Lena Peak, but I can be eight and change gallons per hour. I can be sub nine gallons per hour at like 144 knots. And your cylinder head temps probably came down even more because you have less fuel going into the engine, so it's not burning as high. That's where you get into that rich of peak. Were you, so you went to Richard Peak? On the, yeah, today was rich, so my cylinder temperatures were, were very much under control. So you saw them peak out, and then and as you kept coming back, they came back down, right? Exactly. It's a whole big discussion. Someday we're going to get some engineers and really talk <laughs> about that, but I was never a fan of rich, or lean of peak. That was not my thing. I'm an old school guy. I'm like, oh, why would I want to do that? But a lot of people don't realize that it's actually less fuel and better for the engine because it's you end up getting cooler because there's less fuel burning in the engine. So, but again, game injectors help us keep that uh, even and make our lives a little easier. Else, one would be really going off the chart as they're trying to get rich and then lean to peak, and then to get that one down, you're going way lean on the other one. So, the game injectors really helped that. Has that been your experience? That's exactly my experience. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, so you were down to eight gallons, but you lost six knots. Yeah, when I fly lean to peak. You know, I'd, I'd rather be a speed demon and just burn a little more fuel. Yeah. It's just nice that if I need greater loiter times, Cami injectors help me achieve that. Awesome. What other mods have you done to the front of the plane here? Uh, I have the version two of the power flow exhaust for the aircraft. So that gave me a couple of knots, or I could fly the same speed at a little bit less gallon per hour. Okay. So that was nice. What also, I like the sound of it. Uh, the plane came with the um, aftermarket three blade Hartzell prop. Just like with um, Lean Peak and Richard Peak, there's two sides of this battle. <laughs> Two-blade two or three-blade. They say the uh, two-blade is faster in cruise and slower on climb and vice versa with the three-blade. The three-blade weighs a little more. But I've only ever known this plane with a three-blade. And something um, I do appreciate about the three-blade is the Mooney floats. It glides pretty well. Coming in for approach, I feel like I'm less likely to have trouble controlling my airspeed, slowing down, having this third blade. If anyone hasn't experienced the difference between two blade and three blade, if your flight school has the same model aircraft with two blade or three blade, experience uh, the pattern in, in each. I had been um, renting a three blade DA-40 mm -hmm. for two years from, from a, a guy on field at a small corporation. People called that thing a, a, a glider and a floater and hard to land, but I, I, could, I was in firm control of the airspeed in that. Then the flight school picked up a pair of two blade DA-40. So I didn't even think about the, the, the propeller when I got in and flew. Two of my first four uh, approaches for landing ended in go rounds. I was high, I couldn't slow down. It just, it was a dramatic difference in the same model, same year aircraft, two blade versus three blade. So again, while I haven't done that experiment myself, 
it's an eye opener. Yeah. I mean, just my opinion is I don't think there's ever really a right or wrong, except for extreme circumstances on the bell curve. But for the most part, it really has to do with you, your mission, what are you flying, what's most important to you? I mean, in my planes, you know, I had in the Carbon Cub, I went from the two to the three because I am flying on grass a lot. I am going into bush kind of stuff. So I want the clearance from oh, the yeah. front of my plane. Same thing with this. You have more clearance in the front of it. So if you're, if you're at a grass strip or something and that's where you live, sort of maybe you definitely want more of a three blade and you just figure out the trade-offs and vice versa. So I've never really seen in my 15 aircraft really a, is there a right or wrong? It really just depends on your mission and things and what's important to you. But uh, so it is sexy though. I like this prop. This looks <laughs> great. So what else did we do to the front of this airplane? So uh, I have the latest generation of Whelan LED lights uh, all around this aircraft. This landing light is bonkers bright. On the ground, you turn it on, it was dramatic how bright it was, but there were a couple of eye openers in this one. I was approaching just past sunset to my home field airport. I saw the, all the white paint on the runway glowing. I, I, like, why is it glowing? I flipped off my landing light, it disappeared landing light back on. I didn't even know there was a reflective yeah. material in the white paint until I switched to LED lights. Yeah. The other funny thing I noticed turning my light off and on is that the neighborhood past the airport, I was making the stop signs reflect back at me. <laughs> so. we, Whelan's got some awesome stuff. There's okay. no doubt. We're just putting on the extra. We're just doing all new Whelan lights on the, uh, the extra next week. So what else did we do? Anything to the gear or? We had to replace the steering horn and there's also a service bulletin to add a spacer in there, which slightly changes the geometry of the nose gear. The plane was getting a little bit wonky on landing. And uh, we did find that the steering horn was a little bit out of tolerance, it had a little bit of play. And that millimeter of extra play, the difference between whether when you land, your plane goes straight or the nose is jumping left and right. Yeah. So um, uh, a company called Laser, L-A-S-A-R, out in California, specializes in refurbing or building Mooney parts. Mm. Um, some are speed mods, and uh, some are just serviceable parts for your plane. So they were able to get me into a new steering horn and get me the spacer for the service bulletin to change the nose wheel geometry, and that made a huge difference in my landings. That's awesome, Dramatic. I didn't know about that. All right, cool, should we move on to the rest of the plane? Yeah, let's do, right, it. do it. So Liam, talk to me about those three black discs right there. Yeah, so these th three black discs are your landing shock discs. One of the uh, kind of signature things you see on a Mooney. I believe there's some other aircraft with this, but uh, I believe all Moonies have this. So these are actually rubber. We call them hockey pucks. So they look and feel like a hockey puck. These are three separate discs here. And they compress over time. They get dry over time or the, the weight on them compresses them over time. And you can measure them and there will be a measurable difference in millimeters of compression. So mine were compressed when I bought the aircraft. And so uh, we ordered new ones and put them out on the mains. There's four on each main and three up here. And uh, that does actually make a noticeable difference in the smoothness of your touchdown. This is an air filter bypass that you can open with the control inside of the cabin. You can only do it in clean air. No smoke, no clouds, no precipitation because your air is going in unfiltered. But in this naturally aspirated aircraft, this gets me about one inch of manifold pressure in cruise. So Liam, before we get into like some of the mods you did and the speed mods and things like that and stall mods you're gonna talk about, this is the 67, it's the F model. So, but yours is kind of like a 67, 68-ish. Like what, what was the big change in the F model? Cause I think it got a little longer in things, right? Yeah, so when Mooney introduced the F model, uh, they kept the recently introduced 200 horsepower mm -hmm. Lycoming but they extended the body, and I forget how long, so we'll call it seven to 12 inches. And a lot of that body extension actually goes for the rear seat occupants. Which is a big deal, because before <laughs> that, before there that, was no rear seat. <laughs> basically, be before that, the front seats, when they were back, were against the rear seats. Now when the front seats are back, you can actually still have a passenger back there, and their legs will survive it. The 200 horsepower motor was introduced in the mid-60s. Okay. I just forget which model. I forget if it was the E model or okay. C model. But it was a shorter, body, Mooney, they introduced the 200 horsepower. So that plane's actually a few knots faster than this one. It's uh, less parasitic drag and a few hundred pounds less. I'm not an expert by any means on Mooney's other than I think they're the coolest planes out there, <laughs> but this seems like this F model was kind of a little bit of a sweet spot, right? Right be, it was it is, way before the ovation, but there was really a lot of changes that happened in this time frame. 
Well, it was nice to get the longer body and have the 200 horsepower. Something curious about this plane, it's a 1967 per the paperwork, but it's a 68 serial number. The second aircraft of the 68 model year manufactured just a couple of months before the 68 calendar year. All right, so tell me about this mod you got here. You know, there's a bunch of mods in this plane that are stolen from a subsequent Mooney model, the M20J. And that one's worth talking about for just a moment. Ray Lopresti joined Mooney, became a vice president there and focused on speed mods. He had a goal of getting one mile per hour for every horsepower. And so the M20J model Mooney, which is the same body and same motor, but has some different body parts on it. Its nickname is the 201. And you'll see a lot of them actually have 201 painted on the uh, vertical stab, or they'll even have 201 in the tail number. And the reason for that is because they were able to achieve 201 miles per hour with 200 horsepower. Mm. And so a number of those speed mods are available after market. And this is one of them. Actually, this one is not necessarily a speed mod. Just it's stall. a low speed stability okay. mod. It, it, I believe it's supposed to lower your stall speed two miles per hour, but introduce more stability when close to stall speed. Okay. And this is something that's a factory component for the J model. Okay, great. All right, let's walk around and look at some of these other ones. Yeah, great. One of the speed mods that I was able to get for this aircraft from Laser is this gap seal here. So we have uh, aileron gap seals and flap gap seals. Without this here, there's a big gap here and you get um, interruption of the air, you get turbulent air. So this smooths the air out on the underside of the wing. Is there any improvement on that speed-wise? I believe these gap seals get you about three miles per hour of performance. So Liam, I noticed that, you know, a lot of the Moonies that go straight down. There's usually like a gap here. What, what is that mod? Like, how does that get installed? Yeah, so this is a two piece uh, fiberglass, I think, mod from Laser. Uh, there's this component here and then this component here. This aircraft did have a smaller fin here that terminates earlier. But bringing this up and introducing this here covers a large gap. There is a large gap here and uh, you know, just a very abrupt surface change here. So this is another component that introduces a few mile per hour performance gain. Now, something interesting on all Moonies or all Mooney M20 series, old or new, is that you will not find a trim tab on the uh, elevator or elevator surfaces. Instead, when you move the trim in this aircraft, the entire vertical and horizontal stab assemblies move. So this moves, this moves. And so you'll actually see where uh, we've scraped the paint a little bit here because this was put together with the right tolerances before it got painted. Okay. So now that it's painted, it's rubbing a little bit. We'll address that later. But this is because this whole assembly moves. It's a very curious uh, trim configuration. It's like a jet star, the big jet, you know, the whole thing moves like that too. That's where, you know, Mooney gets those innovative speed increases. And of course, Matt Cash. Matt Crest, right there, his logo on the aircraft. There you go. Again, this paint job was his idea, his design, his surprise to me. So, of course, we've got to uh, promote and immortalize him on this aircraft. Cool. Let's jump into the office of the plane, cockpit. Let's go. Okay. So, let me walk you through the panel of the Mooney Anomaly. All the way left here, we have one of my favorite parts, the Garmin GFC 500 Autopilot. This thing is digital, it's precise, it's reliable. Um, it, it does what you want. Uh, truth is I hand fly a little less than I used to because I love this autopilot so much. Of course, my G5 here for backup AHARs. It can also interact with the GP, uh, it can also interact with the autopilot system. We have the G3X touchscreen here with EIS. This is the 10 inch version. You can run in uh, full screen it has synthetic vision built in and included as an ADS-B receiver. So I get traffic and weather depicted in real time. We can go split screen, get our maps, plates, airport information, waypoints, whatever we need on the right. We also can expand the EIS display onto the right hand side here and gain additional insight into the components that the EIS tracks. Those components include amps, volts, oil temperature, oil pressure, fuel pressure, gallons per hour, fuel levels, EGTs, CHTs. You have lean assist here. It's very helpful in finding out where your peak is and measuring 
how lean or rich from peak you are as you make your adjustments. We have fuel and range calculators built in as well. We can control our external uh, transponder directly from here. We can also control our second radio and first radio from here. On the center stack here, we have our Garmin Bluetooth enabled uh, radio panel, transponder, the main brain of the system, the Garmin 355, and this is our GPS, this is our director for the GFC 500 autopilot. I load my nav data here, and this is where my second navcom is located down here. I also have right on the panel, the uh, Garmin GSB 15, USB-A and USB-C chargers. And we even did just for convenience for the passengers and convenience for me to not have cables running up to the front, chargers in the rear. Now, something curious about this era of Mooney is that the mixture and prop controls are reversed from what you might find in many other aircraft. So in here it goes throttle, mixture, prop. But in basically any other aircraft I've ever flown, it's gone throttle, prop, mixture. So a little bit of making sure you're paying attention and manipulating the correct controls. Another thing curious about this particular era of Mooney is that I have manual J-bar extended direct linkage landing gear. This bar here, when I slide it down, I move the entire bar to the floor. That retracts my landing gear. I pull it up, lock it in place. My gear is now down and locked. There is no backup system as this is direct linkage. And just to the right of that, I have manual hand pump flaps. So we have a flap position indicator, but I always like to visually verify left and right, make sure everything looks good. Just to the left of the landing gear control, it's a bit hard to see, is our engine cowling open and close controller. The next one left of that is the power boost. The power boost is that ram air door we saw up in the front of the aircraft, just above the air filter. Cabin vent and cabin heat, of course, and a very functional parking brake. In none of the rental planes I've ever rented had a functioning parking brake. I can depend on this parking brake even during run-up, though I'm still in the good habit, I guess, of staying on the brakes with my feet. All right, Liam, so awesome to see this plane. It was so great to actually be here in person and be able to get in it and see all the work you've done to it. I mean, you did an incredible job and I really appreciate you bringing it. And I'm sure everybody's gonna love to see all the details that we get into here, but how can people get a hold of you or what? Cause you have an Instagram account, right? Which... Yeah, so you can find this aircraft and a bunch of fun photos, videos, and content online on Instagram at the Mooney Anomaly. Okay. And you know, we talked in the beginning about if you have a fear of flying or if it's something you thought about, but you're not sure, or you're just uncertain or whatever. I mean, Liam went through it. I went through it. I mean, reach out. There's organizations like AOPA reaching out to people like us. I mean, what are some other ways that people should really just, just go try it, go take yeah. your first step, take action. Take, take that first step. Don't wait. And if you did wait, go do it. Uh, I met a new pilot that got his PPL at 79 years old, not long ago. It can be done. It's, it's not too late for most people. But again, on that, that fear and anxiety, because that really speaks to me, because that, that was a huge blocker for me, and it slowed down my training. I didn't know what to do. I was frustrated, I was scared, and so I reached out to CFIs, I reached out to commercial pilot buddies, PPL buddies, and uh, the ambassadors at AOPA and at E3 can help you as well. I reached out to ambassador, and now DPE, at AOPA, Pat Brown. And Pat Brown had some really great, basic, obvious advice that I hadn't considered. We're in Florida, it was summertime, I was struggling. The turbulence, the bumps, the wind, the noises the airplane made, the steep turns, all of that was scaring me. And it was all happening at the same time. Pat said, I don't care if you're a morning person or not, fly at seven or eight a.m. before the heat has built up and before the storms have formed. If you're a caffeine drinker, well guess what? Not till you're done flying for the day because that will raise your anxiety and thereby raise your fear. If it's steep turns that you're having trouble with while you're not yet comfortable with the aircraft in general, Guess what? Go to your flight instructor and say, we're doing maximum 20 degree turns until I say otherwise. He said, if that's for one lesson, two lessons, or two months, it's your time, it's your success, it's your safety, your comfort, and your money. And if you, you feel like you're not getting a comforting, comforting experience from your CFI, 
choose a different one. It doesn't matter if you switch the eyes in the same room or go to a different room. It, it might feel awkward, and that was slowing me down in switching CFIs, but when I did, I was glad I did. I found one that was like, hey, loosen your grip on the controls. Sit back in the seat, make sure you're breathing normally. Don't hold your breath when you do that. Chill out. You know what? We're just going to go up there, and it's going to be pretty. Anytime you want to take photos, I'll take controls, and when you're ready for more, you tell me. And I'll encourage you for more once in a while. Yeah, and you know, it's a key thing, too, because it's not that CFI that you might have first started working with or you might have, that are bad, it's just, personalities have to mix. I mean, this is a, an intensive process that we go through. So you, you want to make sure you find somebody that you mix well with and feel comfortable with in part of this process. And the key thing that he said, these organizations, AOPA, EAA, and many other ones out there, even E3, they're out there. They have free resources for anybody that's interested. ACE, you know, for the kids up there, the Aeronautical Institute up in, in Lakeland that Sun and Fun is attached with. All those associations are out there. They have great free content and stuff to help, especially the younger generations of people that want to fly, so. But that was great for them, but this was awesome. You did an excellent job with this. I'm so glad you brought it, and uh, I appreciate you being here today. You know, this plane wouldn't have happened without the, the support of our sponsors, the great vendors, the great engineers I spoke with, and of course, the artist, Matt Kress. That's why this gets attention, so I do like to bring it back to that. I'm just a dude with an airplane and, and some debt. <laughs> well, but, let's make sure we put all the links to everybody that was involved in this then. On I'm this. sure they appreciate but, it. Thank you so much for having thank you. me. And thanks Great. for forming right. E3 Aviation. Excellent. Thanks everybody, and we'll see you on the next E3 TV episode. So on. <laughs> <laughs>